Hello and welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope, I'm a junior doctor in the UK and I've had a few weeks off, a bit of a summer break, but we're back explaining medical things in simple terms. My kind of list of ideas and videos I wanna cover is ever growing, but we're coming back with one of our favorite shows on the channel, Cells at Work, so let's just jump into it. It's cool now watching the intro after we're well into the series because we're noticing lots of the things that we've learned about like the macrophage having tea with the monocyte see the dendritic cell why it lives in a tree and the corda tendine of the heart valve it's almost like we're ready for a second season <laughs> I was wondering what these were for a minute because we don't really store our fluid in, you know, a reservoir in the body. Fluid is basically distributed around your whole body, most of it in the cells, that's why we call it intracellular fluid, and the rest we call extracellular fluid. Most of this is immediately surrounding the cells, but a lot of it as well is in the bloodstream. A small minority of fluid is also found in other places like your joints for lubrication, in your eyes to give it the shape, and also in your ears to allow the tiny hair-like cilia to move so you can hear and balance. <laughs> that just looked like I was doing a silly kind of uh, fluid dance there. So these reservoirs, I think we're in the sweat glands. Now the fluid in sweat glands is stored intracellularly, so within the cells and in little pockets called vesicles. We talked a little bit about them in the last episode we covered, but let's show how they work uh, in the sweat glands in this context. So here are a couple of cells in our sweat glands. Nucleus here, it's probably not that accurate. And we have our vesicles containing the actual sweat. When sweat glands get the message that the body is too hot, these vesicles can go through two different processes to be released. The first way is that part of your cell may pinch off with the vesicles inside it and be released onto the surface. This is called apocrine secretion, mainly happens in the sweat glands in your armpits. Or the second way is that the vesicles would travel through the cytoplasm and then fuse with the cell membrane and in doing so release their fluid into the ducts of the gland, a process called exocytosis, literally meaning to exit the cell. We call this merocrine secretion. <laughs> So this episode is called heat stroke and they're using this analogy of global warming. Being a doctor from the UK, I don't know a lot about heat stroke. We don't tend to see it that often, but you know, with global warming, might be something I need to learn more about. Is this really what the dermis looks like? So it's the first time the red blood cells seen the dermis. And why do we think that is? Well, it could be that when we get hot, our blood vessels dilate, they get wider. So they're closer to the surface of our skin. Our blood would be collecting heat from our deeper tissues and organs. And by moving closer to the surface of the skin, this can be released cooling us down, kind of like a central heating system, but in reverse. And this is also responsible for why we go that flushed red color whenever we're hot. <laughs> so white blood cell is also feeling the effects of the hot temperature. And yeah, the cells in your body or specifically the chemical reactions and the enzymes within the cells have a tight window in which they can operate. So everything from your temperature to the pH to and the levels of salts in the body to water to even certain hormones are very tightly regulated, what we call homeostasis but your body can only regulate things to a certain degree. And if it's suddenly having to work extra hard to keep these in control, then the regulation systems can begin to fail. You'll become seriously ill very quickly because pretty much all of the cells and the chemical reactions will end up struggling. <laughs> Oh cool, so they talk here about apocrine 
and they call it eccrine glands here. So basically the sweat, your sweat glands, when the sweat goes on the surface of the skin, it's the evaporation of that sweat that helps cool you down. I didn't expect them to put this kind of detail in, but yeah, it's exactly what we talked about before. As we said earlier in our first example, the apocrine glands here is where part of the cell membrane is pinched off and part of the cell along with the vesicles containing the sweat is released. So part of the cell is actually lost in this process. It's also thought that uh, in apocrine glands, they do also exhibit a part of merocrine secretion as well. But the vast majority of the sweat glands on your skin are eccrine glands here that do merocrine secretion, meaning that the vesicles in the cytoplasm here travel through to the cell membrane, fuse with the cell membrane and release the sweat that way, meaning that no part of the cell is lost in the process. And as we mentioned, the evaporation of the sweat with on the surface here is what takes the heat energy away from the body and cools you down. So we hear that the body's temperature is increasing despite the vasodilation and the production of sweat. And this would all be coordinated within part of the brain called the hypothalamus. So that's responsible for your thermoregulation. And that's, so that's probably the, what this control center here is representing. One of the key things that your brain also does that shouldn't be understated is that it makes you feel incredibly uncomfortable. So you'll do things and behaviors that will cool you down. So it might make you tired, so you stop what you're doing. It'll make you thirsty, so you can replenish those fluids from the sweat, and it'll make you kind of find somewhere to cool down. So these are powerful centers in the brain, and it kind of makes you feel like, you know, how much control do you actually have over your body in these circumstances? <laughs> Right, so we're experiencing symptoms now, so kind of the first sign of heat exhaustion. The first kind of minor illness is often called heat cramps, so our muscles may cramp due to change of salts in the blood due to dehydration, but may have other symptoms too, like feeling a bit lightheaded. Heat exhaustion, the next step up from that is kind of what we're experiencing here, it can make you extremely dizzy, what we call vertigo. Vertigo means any sense of the room spinning, so it isn't a fear of heights, it's just that the symptom that many people experience when they are at heights is that feeling of the world spinning as well. Vertigo and heat exhaustion is from two different mechanisms. Firstly, the actual increase of temperature means your central nervous system, your brain can no longer operate effectively. Secondly, the dilation of the blood vessels to try and lose heat means your blood pressure drops, so you'll have less blood flow to your brain, I meaning it's getting less oxygen. So again, it won't function as well, particularly if you're standing up because your heart is having to pump the blood against gravity. So other symptoms of heat exhaustion would be a fast heart rate as your heart tries to keep your blood pressure up to perfuse your brain, and extreme sweating and extreme thirst for obvious reasons, and also a headache kind of given all the things going on in the brain. I'm pretty sure we'll come on to the most severe heat stroke soon enough in this episode, so we'll leave that till then. <laughs> So our body in cells at work has passed out or fainted. So no doubt the blood pressure has dropped through dehydration. So loss of fluid through the sweating and vasodilation. So widening the blood vessel, dropping the blood pressure. The brain has temporarily lost blood supply causing the blackout. Now fainting is actually a pretty useful thing assuming you don't injure yourself from the process of falling or doing anything dangerous at the time because by laying flat it's easier for the blood to be pumped to your brain because your heart isn't working against gravity. So if anyone around you ever does faint, first of all check they are actually breathing and they have a pulse just keep them lying down, raise their legs up onto the chair and give them a bit of a fan and then slowly sit them up uh, over sort of a few minutes. And it's probably a good idea to give them a drink of water as well. I have heard this story before of someone telling me that someone passed out on a bus once and everyone thought it'd be really helpful by kind of holding the person up. So it just made it really hard for the, you know, the heart to pump to the brain 
the brain, the brain. My brain needs some perfusion. So it didn't help, <laughs> it didn't help the person at all. And here we have heat stroke. So this is a medical emergency where your ability to regulate your temperature fails, which is extremely dangerous symptoms I like heat exhaustion, but much more severe. So the heat injury to the brain can cause loss of consciousness, confusion, even seizures. Your skin now may be completely dry as you've lost all the reserve of fluid. And you may even be extremely short of breath as well. Goes without saying that this is a medical emergency. The person would need an ambulance, so make sure they're in a cool as place as possible and in the recovery position um, until they get urgent medical help. <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> it wouldn't be cells at work without a random uh, pathogen rocking up. You know, heat exhaustion isn't a kind of uh, infective condition, so I think they've just thrown this in for, you know, a bit of extra drama. So apparently this dude is Bacillus cirrus, Never heard of him. It's a type of soil bacteria known to trigger two types of food poisoning. Okay, so either diarrhea or vomiting. So that kind of fits because if we're losing fluid from our gut, either by vomiting it up or through loose stools out the back passage, then if we are hot and we are experiencing hot temperatures, we're more likely to get the complications of heat exhaustion, and heat stroke, because we're gonna be losing fluid, have a lower threshold for complications of heat injury. <laughs> You bastard. Have we seen that kind of language in cells at work before? Maybe I've missed it in previous episodes. Or maybe even the white blood cell is getting confused and using inappropriate language because he's getting heat stroke. Man, so there's nothing the body can do. We've reached the point where the body can no longer sweat. As we said before, people with heat stroke can actually begin to be dry rather than sweaty as they become extremely fluid deplete. This is a very bad sign because without the cooling effect from the sweating, the temperature can then rise extremely quickly, precipitating all the other complications. Even if they got urgent medical care now and we managed to cool the patient down, they're still at risk of huge problems. I mean, even just trying to cool the body externally, we end up having huge fluctuations in temperature as the regulation systems try and come back online. We're at risk of circulatory collapse. We're at risk of kidney failure due to the dehydration and huge shift in fluid as well. So we can get swelling of things like the brain and other organs. So make no mistake about it. We are in a very dangerous position here. And we've seen lots of pathologies in cells at work before, but right now is the most severe we've ever seen the patient so far in this series. <laughs> I was all serious there and then they break, they break out the rain dance. I think I've got my own rain dance from from earlier on. Okay, so the temperature's dropping fast. And I'm guessing the light they're talking about, that might be, you know, some light of the patients going in to the hospital. So I'm guessing they've got medical help now and would be using lots of external cooling. That's a posh way of saying, strip the patient off using cold blankets and ice to try and bring the temperature down. <gasps> Well, hey, so that's unmistakably a cannula. So in the emergency department, one of the first thing we do with anyone unwell is get IV access. So we'd put a cannula in, that's a small plastic tube that we introduce into the vein via a needle. That's what we can see here, the needle as it's been introduced. And so we can give fluids and medications as well. And, and, and also initially when we put it in, we can also take some blood tests as well, which can be pretty useful. It goes without saying that this patient needs lots of fluids. 
And I wouldn't call it a transfusion as they do here. We tend to only use that word when giving blood products. We'd probably use the term infusion as well, just a small little point. Whatever we call it, we know the patient needs urgent fluid resuscitation to correct their extreme dehydration. And also the fluid would be colder than the patient's body. So it would also help bring the temperature down. This is someone we want to closely monitor as well. So monitoring the vital signs, we'd monitor closely the salts in the blood and also the circulation system and the kidneys as well. And just, you know, as we talked about earlier, lots of complications, even though we're getting treatment, they're still not out of the woods yet. So there you go, my thoughts on episode 11 of Cells at Work and only a few more episodes to go to finish the first season. I feel like it's gone quite quickly. Although. <laughs> it's taken me over a year to get here, so not as quickly as many of you guys want, but I will be covering uh, season two if you guys want me to. So please give this video a like, but more importantly, if there's anything I've missed or stuff you wanna talk about, please leave it in the comments below. Like. I know I love reading them, but so many other people um, get engaged in this community as well. And if you haven't joined our community yet, then come on in. It's free to subscribe and we're a growing army here on YouTube. So it just leaves me to say, guys, thank you so much for your support. All the likes, all the shares, everything. I'm truly humbled by it and I'll bring you as much stuff as I can. Now I'm back. So uh, until next time, guys, I'll see you soon. Yeah.